but are we? I mean, there's only one way to find out. Alrighty, we are live and ready. Alrighty, um... Alrighty, so, uh, yeah, we are live, it seems. It's, um, let's see if this is working. Yeah, we could see chat. We can barely see chat. Uh, Barely able to see chat. Will anybody show up? The answer is probably yes, but later.
Hello. Yeah, you can barely see the chat on a screen, and I'm trying to fix that. The problem is, I, I don't think, thought about this very much. Hello! Alrighty. Let me actually do a little bit of editing to this. Let's remove that. Let's add another. Ooh. Alrighty, try typing something. Let's see if this looks good. Alrighty, this is, that's much better. Yes, yes. Also, let me just ask you something. Can you see the Quiz Kid extension on your thing? It should just say test quiz. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of how QuizKit works, what you want to do is, um, you see the little QuizKit logo? Tap on that. Yes. This is the same extension that we use during our trivia games on Tuesday nights, which if you don't do that, uh, you should totally join us because it's really fun and you will know very little of the answers. I find it very difficult and I consider myself to be an NFL historian. Yet, I couldn't answer the question about the 1920s NFL because, of course, Washington Glee Club is an answer and is a football team. That makes sense. How? Doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter. So you can see it. Uh, for those of you, like, okay, I know a couple of people here. So, Tiller, can't you see it? You have to activate it for your thing. Uh, so if you're on mobile, you go to... The quiz kit extension and then I think you hit the three dots yes you hit the three dots next to quiz kit and then just hit grant permission Billy Joe Herbert his name should be a bear it's so Cajun oh my gosh Yeah. So let's just test this out. For those of you who've never played this before, you're going to have 15 seconds to answer two questions, and then we're going to go into the real quiz, which is five questions long, and they're all about the 2012 Saints. Um, so just two quick questions. You'll have 15 seconds to answer. You get more points for uh, guessing quickly, but it's like Jeopardy, so you lose points if you're wrong. Don't be wrong is all I'm saying. Um, everyone... Let's see, who is here, by the way? 
Uh, who is Twitch Details? Probably that's Quiz Kit, and I'm an idiot. Anyway, um, Kibi Higgs, have you set up Quiz Kit? Actually, we'll know after we test it. Who am I kidding? You ready to start this? Because I'm ready to start this. Oh, oh yes. By the way, you, if, yes, it's, ah, I get, that makes sense. Um, Steeler fan, you're gonna have to enable a uh, quiz kit, because I am evil. I have a couple questions just to test it out. Good, you have granted permission. Um, Steeler fan, y'all know it. Uh, once everyone else gets here, I'm just doing a couple test questions, though they are actually real questions. Uh, so if you're ready, just say so. By the way, can you read on this? Okay, it's set up. Yeah, and by the way, I did put a chat thing on the, uh, stream. It's cool. So, uh, let's, let's start off with a couple of test questions. In three, two, one. It, who was called for defensive pass interference more than any other player during the 2020 NFL season? William Jackson, Carlton Davis, Janoris Jenkins, or Jordan Lewis? Alrighty. So, I did the research for this today because I was random. And, uh, two of those guys had five. So, uh, for Carlton Davis and William Jackson, they both got called for pass interference five times. Uh, William Jackson is a defensive back for the Bengals, and Jordan Lewis got called four times with Dallas. Janoris Jenkins got called six times. Yes, why didn't you guess a Saints player? Of course, I mentioned him because remember when I said he could be a cap casualty? Yeah, please have him gone. Two of you picked Jordan Lewis. Unfortunate you didn't think that the guy who was asking that question was gonna ask a Saints question. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, our play-by-play -play guy is now an offensive line coach. Yes, it's the practice round. The real round has five questions. Well, four questions and a meme. Next question. Here we go. Which of these letters cannot be found at the start of an NFL team? I'm not reading the answer choices. Because it's a practice round and I wanted to have some fun with you guys. <laughs> oh, man. Three of those are the lowercase letter L, which can be found at the start of the Detroit Lions. The correct answer is I, which cannot be found at the start of any NFL team. That is an uppercase I, the rest are lowercase Ls. This was called having fun with you guys. So, let's show the final results. And, uh, wow. Congratulations, friend. At least somebody here is trying to play the DPJ route of always getting it wrong. Anyway. I'm... Don't worry. He wouldn't do that. Okay, so now we actually have some real Saints trivia. For the 2012 New Orleans Saints. Four of these questions are actually real, and the final one is just me having fun. So, y'all can see it. Are we ready to start this? Alrighty. Three, two, one. Which of the 2012 Saints head coaches had a better record? Aaron Cromer or Joe Vitt? Oh. 
Alrighty. So. If you don't remember that year, the Saints had that Bounty Gate scandal, which, yes, that's going to take up the majority of this. A lot of this rant is going to be me talking about how much I hate the Bounty Gate scandal. Now, Aaron Cromer was the head coach for the first six games of the season. He went 2-4, and four, whereas Joe Vitt finished off the season the last ten games. He went 5-5. Five and five. The correct answer is Joe Vitt. Who put N.A.? Who put N.A.? Seriously, who did that? Which one of you did that? And why do I think I know who it is? Uh, let's see the scores. Really? Really, mate? Yeah, he was. Uh, the man with the plan? Why did you do this? Why did you do this to us? Don't do this. Try to be cool. Anyway, next question. Who scored the most points in one game on the 2012 Saints defense? Panthers, Giants, Redskins, or Broncos? Uh, considering we played the Chargers that year, potentially. You at least wouldn't have... I would have expected you to at least take the 50-50 shot. Because, you know, you could have been right, you could have been wrong. Now then, before I reveal the answer, I'd like to mention that all four of these teams... They were These four teams scored the four most points against the Saints defense in one game. The Panthers scored 35 against us. The Redskins scored 40. The Panthers again scored 44. Uh, where is that stupid extension? I'm sorry, the Broncos, they managed to score 34, but it was the New York Giants who beat us 52-27 to that year. We went 7-9 in uh, 2012. We've gone 7-9 most years, more than any other. We've only gone 500 once during Sean Payton's, uh, Andrew Brees' time in New Orleans, and that was in 2008. Joe Morgan only caught 10 balls for the 2012 Saints. How many yards did he have? 379, 279, 479, 179. I mentioned this guy, Joe Morgan, uh, and I'll mention a little more about him because he was insane that season. Uh, so, he only caught 10 balls. He had three touchdowns and in the end had 379 yards. That's just insane. 37.9 yards per catch. He had two catches below 10 yards. The rest of them were insane. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little later. Let's see the scores. The man with the plan has decided to come back. I mean, he was the last Saints player to wear the number 13 before Michael Thomas. Steeler fan in Rhode Island leading with negative points. Man, DPJ strategy would have actually worked out here. This is a joke that you only know if you're just... This is an inside joke, mainly. <laughs> but yeah, Joe Morgan, the last player to wear number 13 before. One more normal question. A replacement referee was reassigned prior to our Week 2 matchup against the Panthers. Why? He was at a pregame Saints tailgate, he was a pregame Bucks tailgate, he was at a pregame Panthers tailgate, or he was at a pregame Falcons tailgate. You might remember this story. This was one of the most hilarious stories from the replacement ref debacle. And if you're not aware of this, because some of y'all aren't, and by some of y'all I mean one specific person here wasn't exactly a football fan until this year, 
In 2012, there was a lockout between the NFL and the referees union. So for three weeks, there were replacement referees, plus the entire preseason. Everyone hated the replacement refs. Here's what happened. So, there was a guy who was assigned to referee the Saints-Panthers game in week two. ESPN ran an article showing that he wasn't exactly going to be the fairest of referees because they found his Facebook page where he was an avid Saints fan and where he had posted a picture of him tailgating prior to an August preseason game at home against the Texans. The NFL reassigned him, but they had no knowledge that he was an open Saints fan, despite the fact that if you looked at his Facebook page, it was pretty clear. This was one of the worst stories from it. Uh, so let's see what the true final scores are, because the last question is, as I said, a meme. Steeler fan in Rhode Island, you have positive points. But of course, the man with the plan is playing this the best. Time for the final question, where it will be funny. Who was to blame for this whole debacle? Roger Goodell, Greg Williams, Sean Payton, or the refs? You're not wrong, but we're not taking the absolute value of your score. No, it's always Roger Goodell's fault. It's always Roger Goodell's fault. This whole thing is because Roger Goodell wanted to do a thing. Greg, it's always Greg Williams' fault for failing. No, Greg Williams is just an idiot. He was, he was just the centerpiece of this whole thing. So let's see the final results. Steeler fan in Rhode Island, you win! And you... Man with the plan, you didn't lose! Sorry, KB Higgs. But that's the end of that. Let's get into Ben Rants on the 2012 Saints. The thing that you really wanted to hear for some reason. Okay then, where do we start? Here's, here's where we start. We start with Bounty Gate. Because you can't tell the story of the 2012 Saints if you don't tell the story of Bounty Gate. The biggest bullshit I've ever seen in the NFL. Yes, it was a hard quiz. Anyway, why why was it a complete and utter load of crap? Let's start with the whole, how did it start? The source was a disgruntled former Saints employee. He was a guy we had fired in the offseason. He just happened to talk to the NFL, you know, and he was like, hmm, I got this little story for you. And the NFL later hired him. They hired him in the 2012 offseason. Because he was a neutral party in every way whatsoever. That makes him neutral, and that's totally a good reason to have him. He's your one source. They couldn't corroborate it very well. Do y'all remember the clip of Greg Williams? Um, that Greg Williams clip? Uh, the one where... Excuse me one second... Yeah. Let me see. Because it was like 12 minutes long? Okay, if you don't recall, it was a 12-minute speech prior to um, the playoff game against the 49ers. Do you remember the 2011 playoff game, Saints uh, 49ers divisional round, where Vernon Davis had that catch because we couldn't cover the end zone for the, for the love of God, we should never been in have been in that game because we turned the ball over like five or six times in the first half. But the 49ers just gave us a chance to win the game. We had, yeah, you remember if you don't remember this. Um, apparently this came up during the filming of an entirely separate documentary. Uh a documentary on Steve Gleason and it's a 12 minute speech like he says he's going to knock out Alex Smith and Frank Gore and apparently he was willing to drop cash to the person who who took them out uh so first of all that means nothing 
in my book. I'm sorry, you can't prove in a court of law that he said he will do that. He said he was willing to do that. Which is funny if you look at the end result, because guess what? It didn't hold up in court. It was a 12-minute long speech. A lot of players have said that, hey, we've heard a lot worse from high school coaches. Telling guys to hit the crap out of someone else, especially star players, ain't new. So, like... Okay, fine. It doesn't sound good. I'll give you that. It sounds really bad. But it's not like incriminating evidence of a bounty program. It hints that there could be one, but maybe there are incentives in their contract to making it to the next round. Oh, wait, that's right. Every single NFL player gets a bonus for making it to the conference championship. Hmm, that sounds like incentive enough to me. Maybe he could be referring to that. I know he's not, but still. So, fine then. But the NFL said that wasn't the only thing they had. They had uh, gotten all of our emails and stuff. They got thousands and thousands of pages of documents from the New Orleans Saints. Do you know what they found in those thousands and thousands of pages of documents? Nothing. Not one damn thing. Not a single damn thing that incriminated us. Not one thing that you could say definitively proved that there was a bounty system. You have like 10,000 pages of documents and you don't find anything in there that even hints at it? Um, or that says it explicitly? Or is something where it's like, hey, that's pretty suspect. Really? I find that to be very... weird. It's almost as if you can't prove anything. Funny how that works. Despite the fact that you had guys like Peter King who said, Oh no, there's incriminating stuff in here. It's like, really? Prove it. Prove it. Show us the stuff. Show us your evidence. Otherwise, it's a load of crap. That's how it works. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry, NFL. Look. Here's the thing. Greg Williams. He teaches a dirty style of football. Remember when OBJ was talking... Uh, This was a few years ago, but OBJ mentioned that uh, when Greg Williams was the defensive coordinator with the Browns, like, he told him to hit dirty and hit hard. And this was prior to a matchup they had against the Jets when Williams had been hired away. This was the season after... This was 2019. This was 2019, so literally, like, a couple seasons ago now. It's not a shocker. Greg Williams wasn't just... That after Bounty Gate, he was known for a very long time as a... He was a guy who taught a physical style of defense, who constantly rushed. Uh, Pass rush was his specialty. So, him being called for a bounty system sounded right. Like, if you wanted to target a guy who was instituting a bounty system, I would have assumed you'd choose a guy like Greg Williams, because his players played like it. I mean, a lot of Vikings fans who need to shut the hell up because you guys had a bounty system going in the same year that we apparently had a bounty system going. There's the, the year before that, too. It's called 2008. It's in Brett Favre's book. You want to read it one time? Because it's in there. Turns out y'all were doing it, too. I'm not trying to do a whataboutism, but I'm just saying it's like, you know, don't throw stones in a glass house. Just saying. Because, uh, y'all got no, y'all got nothing. Yeah, we played dirty in that 2009 NFC Championship game. I agree, Anthony Hargraves did pile drive Brett Favre into the ground, and that did warrant the flag that came out. But the high-low hit? I don't think that got flagged because it wasn't necessarily illegal. And by the way, if you watch that game, yeah, they're hitting the hell out of Brett Favre. But Brett Favre said in interviews he wasn't mad about it. He's accepting of it. It's like, well, what else would you do? Try and let him have fun? Let him have time in the pocket and tear you apart? No. He knew it was happening. He'd had it happen to him several times in his career because he's Brett freaking Favre. Alrighty? He ain't no randy-ass quarterback. He's Brett Favre. He's been around long enough to know what it's like. He's probably had it happen to him multiple times where guys were clearly targeting him. So why would he complain about another game where it happens, especially an NFC Championship game when, you know, you're trying to win to go to the Super Bowl? You know, the Super Bowl, the thing where you win a championship? It's so big, you don't want to, like, take any advantage you want to get? 
<sighs> anyway, there was that. Plus, every single player suspension, there were player suspensions that were given out for Bounty Gate. None of them held up. They went to court. Paul Tagliabue, former NFL commissioner, uh, presided over it. They couldn't prove that any of the players they had tried to suspend were a part of the program. Huh. Funny how that works. It's almost as if you had no evidence. It's almost as if your thousands and thousands of pages of documents ended up meaning nothing. Like, seriously? What? what? It, uh, it, uh, huh? <sighs> Here's the other thing. Do you remember how long Greg Williams' suspension ended up lasting? It was an indefinite suspension. You know how long it ended up lasting for? T take a guess. How long? He was out of football. Cause, cause, cause it, cause it, cause it, cause it doesn't make any sense. Can you name it? I'm asking you in the comments. And by comments, I mean Joe. It wasn't. It was a year exactly. It was one year. I looked into it. The NFL gave a reason for why it was only one year. He apparently accepted responsibility and promised to never do it again. Ah, yes. I think that makes it reasonable for him to be allowed back on a football field. I mean, yeah, coaching. Because he'll never do it again, despite the fact that it was apparently a thing he'd already done in other places. Like, apparently he'd done it in Washington and in Buffalo. Yeah, you gotta love the honor system in a game where you could be killing someone. Look, you want to know something about uh, how we felt about Greg Williams, the Saints? In 2014, the Saints opened their preseason at the Rams. It was the first time the Saints were ever going to play a Greg Williams defense. Um, We usually would have, at the time, we used to, like, in the first game of the preseason, we'd let our starters play the first game. I'll go into what it was to the NFL, um, but we usually would play our starters for like a series. We didn't, and I think Sean Payton either said or it was just alleged that the reason they weren't going to do it, I think this was more alleged, people thought that they were going to intentionally try and injure Breeze, that Greg Williams was going to send a defense at them to intentionally try and hurt Breeze. They were afraid that Greg Williams was... um. Like, still really angry at Sean Payton for it. Now, granted, it should be noted that the Rams were the team that hired him in the offseason. We fired Greg Williams after the 2011 season. Uh, and we replaced him with Steve Spagnuolo. And Greg Williams went and accepted the job with the Rams. But then, because the suspension lasted for the full year, he went to the Titans the year after. Uh, and then the Rams hired him. Now, he didn't exactly do great things with the Rams. Besides, you know, prevent some Hail Marys, which is pretty cool. Yeah, because this, this one thing about a Greg Williams defense, and uh, Jaguar did a video on it. He's the guy that runs the trivia stuff, by the way. Yeah. Oh, Spags, yikes. Don't get me started on how much I hate him still. Okay, I still haven't forgiven him for this entire season. Hell, we're half a half an hour in. <laughs> this is going to be a long one, but whatever. Um, so yeah. Greg Williams' defense did not do good things in coverage because he didn't know how to do it. He would always leave guys in one-on-one -on -one situations. Sometimes that worked. When you have a Darren Sharper type, that works. Although, granted, unfortunately, Darren Sharper decided to be a terrible person because certain one-on-one -on -one situations he didn't exactly give the other person a choice. Okay, that was pretty tasteless, but also it's true. Uh... You can look up what I mean. Yeah. I mean, Darren Sharper had all those interceptions, but there were some people he really should not have been left alone with. <sighs> anyway, another thing is that we played the Rams in 2016. I was at that game. Uh, that was Jared Goff's first start, I believe. We beat the crap out of the Rams in that game. And Greg Williams was their defensive coordinator. And then they fired him after the season because Jeff Fisher was Mr. 7-9. and nine. And 
By the way, if you're wondering where Jeff Fisher is, he's the head coach right now at Montana State. He just accepted the job, I think. I like how you say that, but it's unfortunately what he's in jail for. <sighs> that was terrible. Oof. Anyway, so we clobbered the Rams in that game. If you don't remember that game, you you might... Yeah, I know, I'm really terrible and I will make those jokes. Um. Anyway, so we clobbered their asses. We ran one of the best trick plays. Because uh, Sean Payton hates Greg Williams, I think. There's good reason to hate Greg Williams. Greg Williams ruined his life. During the 2012 offseason, throughout that whole season, Sean Payton had a really rough time. He got divorced. Um, he was going through a lot of personal issues. Yeah. No, yeah. Jeff Fisher's son, I believe, plays at Montana State. So it's part of the reason why he accepted it. Like... I mean, hey, want to help your kid and all. I 100% see it. Plus, Montana, I hear, is pretty nice. And also, Montana State's good at football. So, I mean, hey, I'd like to see what Montana State does with him. I think he can do well. But that's not important. What is important is that we beat the crap out of Greg Williams' defense and that we ran this trick play when Willie Sneed threw a long touchdown pass to uh, Tim Hightower. And on the sideline, it, there was this great shot of uh, Sean Payton and Jarius Bird a guy I can go on a pretty decent five-minute rant about why the hell did we ever overpay for Jarius Bird's ass, but that's for a later time. Huh. Yeah, that, that game was a giant middle finger to Greg Williams, and that was the greatest thing I've ever seen, and Sean Payne's never going to coach a game like that because it was a revenge game. Now, here's the thing. Why does Bounty Gate happen when you have no evidence? When you have not much there. Well, if you've seen the movie Concussion, you might be able to get an answer why. If you haven't seen the movie Concussion, you're not alone. Apparently that movie bombed at the box office, uh, despite it being a Will Smith movie. And it was a really good one. If you haven't seen the movie Concussion with Will Smith in it, you should. It's really, it's, it's insanely good. Um... But it's around that time in 2012 when it came out that the NFL had been pushing down studies and research on concussions and on the long-term effects of football on the brain. So what does the NFL do? Well, they find anything that they can to latch onto to make them look good. It's a PR move because you don't act like you did in that, si in that instance if you gave a shit. They didn't. When... Like, who said earlier that it's almost like the NFL doesn't... Yeah, Steeler fan in Rhode Island, you're right. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal to the NFL at all. Because they knew it was more about the optics than it was anything else. You you find a team that's done something pretty bad, um, and you hold them up as bad actors. It helps that it was a team that had risen to prominence pretty quickly, that was on top... Um, and that had a defensive coordinator who was infamous for being dirty. And for, like, having his players play a physical type of defense. Bada bing, bada boom, what do you do? You get him. And because he had just been fired, it really helped. Um, isn't it also convenient that that year the Superdome was the host stadium of the Super Bowl? Isn't, isn't that funny? And isn't it also funny that during the game, the power went out in the Superdome for the first time since Katrina? You know, when there was the flooding and stuff? I, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. I'm not saying that the NFL conspired to make that happen, although it is rather convenient that the lights went out during a blowout, and then afterward, the 49ers came back a little bit and made it a game. Uh, you know, just conveniently cutting out all of the Ravens' momentum. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that at all. Though I'm also not not saying that. Fuck you, Goodell. <sighs> anyway, so yeah, we did that. Now let's talk about Joe Morgan for a second. Before we start with the Joe Morgan talk, look at this. Look at this play. 
This is what you may know Joe Morgan for. NFL is really going to get pissed off about that, but it don't matter. Um, yeah, did you see that? His knee never touched the ground. Yeah, this guy had 10 catches that year, by the way. Um, let me give you the stats on each one of his catches. In week two against... Yeah, in week two against Carolina, he had one catch for five yards. In week four against Green Bay... He had one catch for 80 yards and a TD. In week 7 against Tampa Bay, that catch was his only catch of the game. Week 12 against San Francisco, one catch for 33 yards. Week 13 at Atlanta, one catch for 38 yards. Week 14 at the Giants, two catches for 106 yards, a 62-yard catch, and a 44-yard catch. Week 15 against the Bucks when we blanked them. Two catches for 61 yards and a TD. 34 yards and 27 yards. And then in week 17, uh, one catch for eight yards. Dude did a lot for 10 catches. Am I right? Like, 37.9 yards per catch. Only two catches inside of 10 yards. You only catch but one ball a game, basically. That guy is one of the biggest... Yeah... I've, I've said this before on my own, but, like, Joe Morgan in 2012 was one of the biggest who-the-hell-are-you guys I've ever seen, where it's like, who the heck is this guy? And why is he balling? Yeah, I mean, and he, he stuck around for a little bit afterward. He didn't really do much. But his 2012 season is one of those where you look at the numbers and you're like, this isn't right. This isn't right. This can't be right. You cannot do that on 10 balls. Like, you'd expect a Randy Moss type to do it, but not just this random dude. Hi, I'm Sean Payton, and I make magic. Except Sean Payton wasn't even there. That's what makes this insane. Yep. But but I think it's important that we mention that there was another guy that played for the Saints that year that made me hate things. There's one Saints defensive back whose name haunts me forever. His name is Corey White. Do you know the name Corey White? It's a story no Saints fan ever wants to tell. Huh, <sighs> Corey White. What if you put the worst defensive back in the NFL on a football field? You would get Corey White. Corey White couldn't cover. He never got penalized in the 2012 season, because in order to get penalized, you have to not be getting burnt on every play. Like... Corey White, he didn't suck. He was just not there. I don't get what the point of putting him on the field was. Because, and yes, he had a couple of interceptions, by the way, randomly. Like, I think he picked off Phillip Rivers or something. Yeah, you might remember him because he was so bad. I don't know why. He's just so bad. Honest to God, I've never seen a worse cornerback in my life watching the Saints. And a reminder, I've watched the Saints this decade... And I've seen a lot of bad. I have seen... No, I'm not... I'm I'm saying that because I think he did. I legitimately think he actually picked off uh, Philip Rivers. But I'm double-checking it. Uh, He only threw one interception that game. It was Roman Harper that picked him off, excuse me. No... Though Corey White, he did have one interception. I just don't remember when. What I do know is that Corey White sucked. Corey White was one of the worst players we ever had. Like, I, and I didn't mean to, like, do it because, like, ha 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 ha, he did it to Phillip Rivers. You can respect Roman Harper, but Roman Harper was not good. Like, he was not that good. Roman Harper was a, a Marcus Williams type. If Marcus Williams... I seriously have to compare the two because they hit the same way. He never tried to wrap up a guy and tackle him. He tried to hit him and see if that would get him on the ground. And guess what? It didn't work. 
honestly, I've read some articles, and in fact, I'm going to read through one uh, when we get there. Because honestly, I think the stream's going to be... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Corey White was terrible. Patrick Robinson, he had eight penalties for 89 yards and four pass interferences on that team. Mate, could you not... Could you just, like, not be penalized? Ugh. <laughs> Two words, Brandon Browner at a third, 2015, the most penalties by an NFL player since they've been tracked, and he did it in 14 games, because Brandon Browner couldn't adapt his play style to the rules that he created. Anyway, let's talk about some of the games from the 2012 season. Remember the opening game when RG3 and Pierre Garçon decided to tear our asses a new one? I do. It still has. I still have the nightmares. Now I'm gonna note that I didn't go to any Saints games in the 2012 season because uh, they were just too loud, and at the time I was very sensitive to hearing. I was also in the middle section of the Superdome, and there were constantly fights. That's not even a joke. Yeah. Uh, let's just say that holy crap, Washington took us to task. Like RG3's first game, if you don't remember. He decided to come out and look like a god. I still have the nightmares of Pierre Garçon just tearing us apart. Ugh. It's so scary. But I think the next game that I should talk about is the Kansas City game. Now, I watched that game from a restaurant called Mother's in New Orleans. Do you want some of the best breakfast food in the city, you go to Mother's. It's one of the best places I've ever been. I've only been once, and I had a really bad experience watching a football game there. <laughs> Let me explain. So if you don't remember this game, maybe you remember Jamal Charles running 96 yards down the sideline with nobody even close to him? Yeah, that was that game. Basically, the Saints had that game all in their hands. They had it. They were going to win get their first win in week four. And then the defense came out and said, here I come to screw the day. <sighs> Hopefully my mic didn't go too, too loud on that. By the way, how is the audio? I have not asked. Is the audio good? Yes. The classic question. Is the audio... Alrighty, good, good. See, I get concerned because I will yell a lot. Um, oh yeah, that's right. I haven't gotten to the angry part. So basically, we had the Kansas City game uh, locked up. And what happened was this. The defense came in, shat the bed, we went to overtime when we definitely didn't need to, and then we lost. We lost to a team that wasn't that good. Like, just, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing? <sighs> and then the Packers game happened. That Packers game was painful. Because we lost it 28-27. to Because Garrett Hartley missed a field goal. Do you know why he missed a field goal? Because earlier on, an er we had an earlier field goal attempt where it was good. Except it was called back for holding. <sighs> so then Garrett Hartley, Garrett Hartley, the guy who sent us to the Super Bowl, yeah, he sucked as a kicker. He was not a good kicker. Um, he constantly missed. Like, he missed a 40-yard field goal against the Bucks in Week 16 of the 2009 season from the same damn spot that he kicked that game-winning field goal against the Vikings. Because kicking in the NFL is hard. I mean, it is. It really is. I was there for the Brown Saints game a couple years ago when their kicker left, like, nine points on the field because he decided to fail. That was funny because there was a Browns fan behind me when they scored that game-tying touchdown and then they missed the extra point and I was like, right before the kick, I was like, oh, you need to wait. Your kicker still has to attempt the extra point. And then it was no good. And I was like, see? You have to do the thing first. It was funny. Oh yeah, you would enjoy that. You would have enjoyed that game watching the Browns give it to us so easily. Oh, it hurt. 
it hurts so much as a fan because I was like, you guys did not deserve to lose this game. You, you lost the Zane Gonzalez. Watching afterward that Will Lutz went over to Zane Gonzalez and just consoled him and was like, hey, are you okay? That was really nice. <laughs> really? Chargers special teams screwing up? Who could have ever predicted that? Money Badger, man. Don't take names from LSU players and give them to yourself unless you're actually worthy of it. Anyway, yeah, we missed. Then we beat the Chargers. All I'm going to say is we dominated them because we had an insane offense and it just kept going. Plus, our defense was getting some decent pressure in that game because the NFL uploaded the highlights from that game and you could see that we almost lost it. You see, the defense did this thing all year where it was like, no, you can have it. You can just have this. It's fine. It's fu It's fine. Hey, I'm going to make fun of the Chargers because they have a stable quarterback and I'm jealous of that. Hey, the Chargers have cap space, a stable quarterback, and hope for the future. I have none of those things. So, let me have this. <sighs> anyway, the Giants kicked our asses. They didn't just kick our asses, they absolutely manhandled us. I don't remember that game very well, probably because it's buried in the deepest recesses of my mind. Most of this season, when I looked back through the Pro Football Reference page, I realized something. I didn't remember as much of this season as I thought I did. I honestly can't get as mad at this season, mainly because I don't count this season. This was an asterisk season. It wasn't like the 2015 season when we had all of the talent in the world and we fucked it. Hey. You say that, but maybe, just maybe, you'll win the AFC wild card game and then lose in the divisional round. Because you're not winning the AFC West with Mahomes still in it. God, imagine being a fan of, like, that. That's that's really stupid. Oh, my God. It was like being an Expos fan, probably, when they were really good and couldn't win their division. Anyway, yeah. Do you know the story of the game we should have lost but didn't because the Cowboys just had to go to overtime and we won the coin toss? <laughs> the Chargers would never lose in the divisional round. They have to make the divisional round first. <laughs> anyway. So, the NFL actually uploaded this video, so I watched it, and it reminded me so very much about why I hate the 2012 Saints. Because we had a lead of 14 points with 3.35 to go, and we won the game in overtime somehow. This is a consistent theme, where if we had a big lead, where if we had a two-touchdown lead with like five minutes to go, we could give it up, and we would give it up. Because our defense was so bad, it would just... Hmm. Well, yeah, it, it was... It, it, the NFL throwback uploaded a video of it, so you can find it there. It was from uh, week 15. Week 16, excuse me. It was our 15th game of the season. Yeah, it's 3.35 to go in the game. We're up 31 to 17. Then, with 3.35 to go, excuse me, the Cowboys score a touchdown... Then they score a touchdown with 15 seconds to go, and then they screw up, and they give the ball to us, and then we win the game. I'm sorry, but it was so bad. It was so bad. How did we do it? Did you know that when we won that game, we went to 7-8, and eight, and we finished that season with a 7-9 and nine record? The team that had given up more yard... I mean, the previous record holder of... Most yards ever given up by a defense went 2-14 and 14 and drafted John Elway, who proceeded to say, no, screw you, I'm not going to play for you and bitch about. I have no sympathy for you, John. You wanted to go to a bad team. You wanted to go to a good team. You're the number one overall draft pick. That's not your job. Your job is to... Uh, 
report to the team that drafted you and hope and pray they trade you. Or, you know, just, I don't know, don't be an asshole. I thought it was either the 81 or the 82 Colts, I'm not sure. Uh... Most yards given it up. Oh. Okay. The most points allowed is the 81 Colts. Uh. The second most was the 81 Colts. Yeah. 81 Colts. Yeah, that's right. 82. Yeah, 82 wouldn't make sense. I am an idiot. It was the 82 Colts that were the ones that drafted Elway, but the 1981 Colts... Yet I'm still right that they were 2-14. and 14. Eh. That's true. Yeah, imagine, imagine giving up 6,000 yards that quickly. Imagine giving up 7,000 yards. Oh, wait, that's what we did. See, I need to talk about the Saints defense as a whole. We gave up 7,000 yards. We gave up the second most points in the league. We gave up the second most points in the league. Take a guess at what our point differential was, though. Because we scored the third most points in the league. Anybody want to take a swing at our point differential? It's very close. It's close to zero. It's close to zero, but it's not zero. It's within it's within one possession of zero. I'll give you the answer now. It's plus seven. We scored 461 points. We gave up 454. So, yeah. We had an insanely good offense that year. See, here's the thing that I find interesting. We went 7-9 and nine with the worst defense the NFL had ever seen. Because we had the sixth easiest schedule in the NFL. Tied with the Giants. One of the easiest schedules in the NFL. We had a point differential of plus 7, but we were outgained 7,042 to 6,574. That's a difference of 468 yards. Here's the other thing. We couldn't run the ball. What a waste of an offense. Hey, stop talking about the Saints in 2012 and 2014 and 2015 and 2016. Um, yeah, the Saints wasted their offense. Which year are you talking? God, being a fan of this team isn't fun. Imagine having a great offense and then your defense sucks so much ass so you can't do better than 7-9. and nine. <laughs> Please come back to me when that statement is no longer true. We couldn't run the ball, by the way. Fourth fewest attempts, eighth fewest yards. We kept playing keep up. Because defense is bad, so you've got to throw the ball. Um, and we were running back by committee. Like, Mark Ingram was our lead rusher. He was the guy with the most rushing yards, and he had 602. You had Pierre Thomas, he had 400 yards. When you have running back by committee, it's not exactly easy for you to establish a ground game. So, yeah. Not, not exactly great. Oh, let me just look at something. By the way, we gave up the most yards per drive of any team in the NFL. Yep. 36.6 yards per drive. Our offense averaged 34.7 yards per drive. So yeah, it was bad. It was really bad, our defense was. But I think it's funny when you look at the little Bleacher Report thing that I read. Because I found an article from prior to Bounty Gate coming out where they talked about what we could do. Would you like to hear some funny predictions and funny statements? 
<laughs> Are you ready for the biggest laugh of your life? Here's what somebody actually was paid to write about the 2012 Saints. A reminder, all of the things I'm about to read are true. So, they wanted the Saints to sign Dequel Jackson. Dequel Jackson got signed to an extension. He was a middle linebacker for the Browns. He got signed to a five-year, $42.5 million extension. Third safety, Steve Spagnolu loves to use the nickel package against passing teams. He will often use three safeties, which will work well with Roman Harper essentially becoming a blitzing linebacker. Why couldn't we do that? Roman Harper would have done really well as a blitzing linebacker, because he reminds me of Von Bell type in the sense that... Now granted, Von Bell can actually hit hard and wrap you up and tackle you. Roman Harper can hit you hard, but he can't wrap you up and tackle you. Hey, does anybody remember when Juju Smith-Schuster kept talking shit and then he got his ass leveled? Oh, I forgot there's a Steelers fan in here. <sighs> Sorry, that was just a really satisfactory moment, especially when it was Von Bell, because I, like, don't hate Von Bell. And I don't hate the Bengals because they have Joe Burrow and I need them to protect Joe Burrow with his life or else we will extract him, like I've said a million times. Yeah, a pass rushing defensive end. Steve Spagnuolo likes to blitz, not necessarily to the same extent. We needed a big physical. I need to find the funny stuff. Oh, in this article, they mention us going after the late, great Vincent Jackson. Hey, I'm sorry that I am a Bengals somewhat fan. I'm a Joe Burrow fan. I like Von Bell. Von Bell never did anything wrong. Did Juju Smith-Schuster need to shut up, stop doing TikTok dances on the field, though? Like, come on. Dude deserved it. He did need to get himself to shut up. Yeah. R.I.P. Vincent Jackson. It's sad. It was a... It, he was tortured by, uh... His alcoholism is it's a really unfortunate passing. I, I did not expect that. I really, like, I had a lot of respect for Vincent Jackson because he played on the Bucks and he always terrorized us. It was like, hi, I'm Vincent Jackson. Try covering me. You can't. And I was like, we don't have a defense. It's not fair. And he was like, hey, 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 so this was during the time when the Saints needed to re-sign. No, but the thing was, it wasn't just the dancing. It was the culture that I think was surrounding what was happening there. It felt like he was playing loosey-goosey with it and not taking the game as seriously as I thought he needed to. Because, like, I 100% get if you're having fun. If you're having fun, that's a good thing. This is sports. They're not meant to be boring. If you're being bored with sports, then you're not playing them right. So I would get if on the one hand, that's a way that he releases some of that tension. Okay, fine. If maybe it was a lighthearted thing. You know, it's something like that. But when the other team clearly sees it as a sign of disrespect, and when everyone has seen what... Okay, so here's why I think it's important. Because if you're a human, if you're a wide receiver, you know what happened when Terrell Owens did that thing on the star at Dallas, uh, at Texas Stadium. If you remember that celebration, you've seen the clip, you know why you don't do that kind of stuff. It's because it's not going to end well for you. What's going to end up happening is you're going to piss off the other team and they're going to do something like, oh, I don't know, clock you. George Teague was 100% justified, in my opinion, in knocking Terrell Owens on his ass. Because that kind of stuff was Bush League. I just think it was a bit too much. And again, I get if guys want to have fun with stuff. Yeah. I mean, he earned it. No, because he had made more TikToks than he had reception all year, though. Like, that was a problem people had. Now, granted, can you blame most of that on the fact that they didn't know who the hell to throw it to? And they fact, and yes, Chase Claypool became like a really good target, and I think he's going to be a future guy. Um, wasn't Chase Claypool also the guy who said that the Browns are going to get their asses beat in the next round after they beat the crap out of the Steelers, or was it some other guy? Because I genuinely don't remember. 
Yeah, in a broken offense. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I'm thinking about that for a second, and I'm like, yeah, because Ben Roethlisberger is obviously cooked right now. I, I don't think that that's really a slight against him. He just is. It's his time to retire. When he was thinking about retiring, that's when he probably should have hung him up, or at least had something in place to retire. Breeze, he was thinking about it. He signs that deal with NBC. You know he's going to retire. Yeah, and it was Claypool. Claypool, that kind of stuff just isn't right, in my opinion. Because it's like, do you really need to add fuel to the fire? Do you really need to? Look, I get what a good rivalry is supposed to have. I am a Saints fan, and I believe the NFC South is made up of the best rivalries in the NFL. Because they're the right type of rivalries. They're like college football rivalries. Because when Cam Jordan sent Cam Newton his wine uh, after sweeping the Panthers... That was good. Okay, that kind of stuff, that's 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 the type of uh, rivalry stuff that I really enjoy. Because it's a little petty. It, it's, the, it's the level of pettiness that you like in a rivalry. Um, the kind of stuff where, like, the other team will steal away your uh, one of your directors to make their GM, and you hate on that. Like, I am dealing with right now, oh my god, Falcons, why did you do that? What do you mean by we? And then we 28 0 them. I'm confused. I am so confused because I just lost track. Ah, yes. That's right. He adopted the Browns. I forgot about that. Anyway. Yeah. No. Nah. Chargers have been weird. Doesn't count. Should we get back to me rambling on about the Saints? Uh, let's see. The holes. The defense. Hey, look. The defense. It was a hole. <laughs> You're not wrong, actually. Yeah. Let's do more Saints stuff, because here's my thoughts, by the way. I can't do a normal podcast and do this, so I'm thinking about making it so that every Thursday it's just live, talk about random stuff, have fun that way. This is just supposed to be... Oh god, it must have hurt. Anyway. The, gr the Saints have great corners. This is a statement that is said multiple times throughout this article. I would like to ask one question. Had they watched the Saints? Really? Great corners. Now granted, could they have seen that Corey White was going to start for the Saints? And that he would end up being... What's the word? Trash? Garbage? A waste of time? The thing that is the bane of my existence? No, that's Brandon Browner. Um... Yeah, the dramatic irony is stunning. It's like, hmm. Yeah, a lot of this feels so hilarious when you look at this, and it's like, the Saints have talent, and it's like, really? Because I didn't see it. 7,042 yards don't sound like talent. Sounds like a load of shit. Despite being the most talented group in the entire league, the Saints' defensive backs were victimized time and time again by opposing offices. By opposing offenses. I'm sorry. Most talented group in the league. In 2011 with Tracy Porter? Really? I I mean, this was written before the entire offseason had happened. This was written in February of 20, uh, 2012. So this before a lot of stuff had come out. Reading through it hurt. Reading through it is so bad. Because it's like, oh, you have no idea. Oh, you have no idea what we're about to do, do you? Um, yeah, we're about to just show the league what bad looks like. We're about to redefine what defensive futility looks like. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to sign Rob Ryan as our defensive coordinator. He's going to look good for one year, and then he's going to be terrible the next two years after that when the Saints defense decides to completely shit the bed. We're going to hire Dennis Allen then to 
It was like, at one point, to pressure Rex Ryan into getting better. He will not get better. The Eagles will tear us to shreds. We'll give up, like, 500 yards to them, and then Rob Ryan will be kicked to the curb faster than you can say, get the hell out of my house. <laughs> God, if you think the 2012 Saints were bad, I, I will contend the 2012 Saints were bad, but the 2012 Saints were also messed up due to Bounty Gate. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, that's right. Rex and Rob Ryan were wanted as coaches. I know, that sounds funny to me, too. Oh, uh, my God, that was, that was not a good time. The funny, the only thing that was ever worthwhile that we got out of that was the dude in the stands at Saints games who always dressed up like Rob Ryan and looked basically the same. And if you don't remember that, just look it up. It's, it's funny. Um, anyway. Yeah, adding a third safety to play in sub-packages would allow Roman Harper and Malcolm Jenkins to rotate as blitzing safeties. That's definitely worked, especially if you've seen how we used Malcolm Jenkins in the 2020 season, where we allowed him to become that blitzing safety, and it worked pretty well. Aside from that, they need to improve... The Saints... Fig Saints secondary personnel figures to improve as a result of the new schemes from Steve Spagnolu. Okay, the 2012 New Orleans Saints gave up 4,681 yards passing, which was second worst in the league. I don't know how you call that an improvement. However, I will give them... I will give them the sense that they didn't know that Corey White would start. And, um, if you knew that Corey White would start, you wouldn't have said that. Uh, we had... Unproductive interior linemen, that's a good point, because we really didn't have great... We didn't have a great pass rush on the inside. It was Cam Jordan, it was Will Smith in 2011 that was getting to the quarterback more. Uh, Martez Wilson shined in the final four games of 2011. He looks like a player going forward. Martez Wilson had 19 tackles for the 2012 Saints. 14 solo, 19 combined. This is a really, really bad statement. Yeah. Joe Vitt is obviously an amazing coach. Joe Vitt was then not the coach for a while, so maybe that helps explain why the linebackers sucked. Salary cap status. God damn it. If you think the Saints were bad this time, they've been bad for a long time. The Saints and the salary cap have not been friends. Nah. Because... Oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. We had $45 million in space. We had $45 million of space. What? But three, $30 million of that cap space was going to be taken up uh, by three players because we were going to... We franchise tagged Breeze in 2012, so he got $16 million that year. Which, by the way, I didn't know how the franchise tag worked. I don't think we're going to be able to re-sign Trey Hendrickson. Because the franchise tag, I didn't know how it worked. I'll be honest. It works where you pay the average of the top five salaries of any player at that position. You think we got the money to do that? I mean, my God, I was watching Tom Grossi today, and, like, the Packers are down to $12 million in cap room, and they had to release some really big guys, so I'm like, oh, we're screwed. Oh, 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 we are boned. So boned. I would just, I wish I, I just wish we had cap space. I mean, it could work if you just crumble and die. God, I hate this team right now. It hurts. Positive elements of the Saints' current cap situation. God, I wish I could say that right now. <laughs> uh, let me think. To franchise or not to franchise, stupid thing. We had a bunch of free agents that we kept. And then a bunch of stuff here. I'm trying to find where it is. Where the hell is this? You stupid piece of stupidness. I don't know. I don't really know what else to say. Because here's what's bad about the 2012 Saints. When I started reading into this team, 
I realized how little I had to say about it. Because it was so long ago, I barely remember it, and I've probably repressed a lot of the memories. I'm still yelling about the 2012, I mean, the 2015 Saints. I'm like, that defense pissed me off more. I'll just explain why. The 2015 Saints defense committed more penalties than they needed to. The 2012 Saints didn't commit that many penalties. The 2016 Saints decided, I mean, 2015 Saints said, penalties? Sweet! I'm going to commit them all. I just need to talk about, uh, hi, I'm not asking for that, I'm asking for 2015. 2015 Saints, you had this man named Brandon Browner, 20 penalties for 202 yards, that 8 holding penalties, 3 pass interference penalties, 3 unnecessary roughness penalties, I'm sorry, what? Are you, are you kidding me? Those kinds of stupid mistakes in 2015, not only that, but if you look at the rankings for the Saints, they weren't, there weren't as many bad ones. Um, like, for example, a lot of teams didn't run against us, so we were 23rd in runs allowed. We had the worst rush defense in the entire NFL. Oh, I didn't notice that. Uh... Apparently, not not too bad, though, with allowing scores. That's weird. Uh, turnover percentage. Eh. Hey, time of possession. It wasn't... Hey, don't worry. Brandon Browner's in jail now. Guess what he's in jail for? I'll give you a hint. We had a guy on the, 20, on the 2009 Saints that was in, that's in jail for longer for the same thing. Brandon Browner, here's the thing about Browner, he brought about a lot of rule changes, they changed the way that he was like the Mel Blunt of nowadays, because he was so physical with guys at the line. Oh, you're not aware that Brandon Browner's in jail for, for like, bad, like, yeah, he did a, he did a, I'm trying not to let this thing get like, Blocked on certain things. He did a maybe bad thing where he's in jail for a few years now. Yeah, I remember reading the, about this like two years ago where he's in... It's not as severe as Darren Sharper, but he's still in jail for that. Yeah. I think he's in jail for two years or something. It, it's not good. Yeah, Sharper's locked up for 20. Uh, Browner's only tw two years... Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm not even kidding you, that's a thing. Anyway, you look at the 2012 Saints, and it's like, okay, maybe it's acceptable. You look at 2015, though. A team that gave up 476. The other thing was, our offense couldn't score as much. Um, yeah, our offense couldn't score as much. Our defense gave up the most points in the NFL. Yeah, you shouldn't be surprised that the the idiot did that. Yeah. Our defense gave up the most points, 476. If you're wondering, wow, okay. Whoo! Sir, um that is a very good one, and I will give you that. Oh my god, that's... Did you really have to say that? You did not have to say that, dude. Oh my god. It's so... It's so wrong. I mean, it's true. <sighs> you win. You win. That is not getting topped tonight. Anyway, so 20... 2015, we gave up more points than we did in 2012. We didn't just give up more points. We gave up 22 more points. I've said worse things. No, I know that, but what you said... <sighs> I have said a lot worse things in my life. Trust me, I've said a lot worse things. Maybe not live. Uh, nah, I think I did. 
I think I did when I tried making a small little jab at, you know, dude who's in jail for 20 years. Let's stop harping on about that and start harping on about the fact that the 2015 Saints gave up 476 yards, I mean, points. They gave up 6,000 yards. It was second most in the league. Um, they gave up more first downs than any team in the league. They had the second worst passing defense, the worst passing touchdowns allowed. They allowed 45 passing touchdowns. They were 26th in the league in interceptions. That's really bad. So, like, I guess only seven teams had fewer interceptions. They gave up the most net yards per attempt. That's always good. Oh, they gave up the second most rushing yards. The most rushing yards per attempt. They also gave up the most average yards per drive and the most, uh, I'm sorry, the most net yards per drive, the most net points per drive. So you look at all of those stats. They're worse than the Saints from 2012. And this was a team that was actually coached well and wasn't having to deal with a bunch of outside bullshit. There's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for a team like that that year. That year was maybe one of the worst games we've played where... We played the Texans, and we scored six points on two field goals, which snapped Breeze's streak of touchdown passes in a game. Games with a touchdown pass, excuse me. So, yeah. I mean, that's really all I got to say about this. Because I can't think of much else to do. Because I've kind of been rambling on and on and on for a while. And that's what this seems to be. Um, how many games did who get up to again? Who are you talking about? Oh, uh, games with, it's 50, it's 54. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, no, he ended the streak in 2012. That's right. It was consecutive games, I think, with a touchdown period. Yeah, against the 49ers, he didn't... It seems... Yep. Do-do-do-do-do. It ended against the Falcons, is when it ended. Because against the Falcons, we only scored 13 points, and the one touchdown we had was on a one-yard TD rush. We almost had this... He almost didn't get... The old one was 47. He almost didn't get there. He threw a TD pass with four seconds left to go in a game against the Rams in 2011 that we ended up losing. Um, and if you don't remember the 2011 Rams, the 2011 Rams were so good that they ended up going 2-14 and 14 and they were head coached by Steve Spagnuolo. Oh, that's where Spags was the previous year. This explains a lot more. I forgot. Okay, I'll be honest. I did not remember that Steve Spagnuolo was the head coach of the Rams, much less in 2011. That that might ex that might explain um, why maybe he was available. Yeah. No, no, Pittsburgh. Uh, they they beat them 27-0. It's funny, that's actually not the worst beating they had that year. The Ravens beat them by more. They beat them by 30. And they managed to beat... Okay, random thing. And I'm going to end this soon because it is 7.15 over here. And I'm going to end this with one last thing. If there's one random team that we always had a problem against that I always remember, it's the St. Louis Rams in the Edward Jones Dome. For some unknown reason, the Rams had some knack for beating us. Or 
playing games they definitely should have been close in. In 2009, we won 26 to 21. Shouldn't have been that close. The Rams weren't that good in 2009. Like the 2009 Rams were 1 and 15. Okay? They were 1 and 15. And we nearly lost to them. That was another Steve Spagnolo team. Maybe it was Spagnolo that did it. I don't know. That could be it. Because whenever we played them at home, yeah, in 2009, the Rams nearly beat us. They had to go with for a Hail Mary, but it was close. I remember 2018 when we beat them by 10 at home. Yeah, I remember 2018. Former division rivals, too. Yeah, I was there in 2018. Because a reminder, the NFC Championship game took place in the year 2019. That's true, we did beat the Rams in our first playoff game. Did you know that prior to that playoff game, there was a voodoo ritual done at midfield? I'm not kidding with you. They did a voodoo ritual at midfield. Azazir Hakim dropping that football may or may not have been a result of that. Also, I remember 20, January 20th, 2019. I was there. I was there. I was 500 feet away from the damn thing and I saw pass interference. We're not going to talk about that here. Because, guess what? I'm still pissed off that we blew a 13-point lead to them. Because we had a 13 nothing lead and we blew it. Like, let's not forget about the fact that the Saints blew a 13-point lead, threw the ball on first down, into the dirt, no less. There's so many things about that game where, like, that call shouldn't have mattered, but it did. There never should have been a moment where that call mattered. At all. The, the, there should never have been a point in that game where that happened. Honestly, if Chris Banjo, or no, Justin Hardy, I think it was Chris Banjo, though. If Chris Banjo plays... His man on that fake punt the right way, he is pick sixing that son of a bitch, and we are dancing our way to the to the uh, Super Bowl in Atlanta. All right, because here's the thing: I can't have a rage-induced stroke, man. I'm already pissed off enough from that game that the type of ra- I've just internalized it. Okay, I've just internalized the rage. Also, it's fifty percent of how I. You don't know how I watch football games. I'm raging half the time because I'm pissed off. I almost had a rage-induced stroke, maybe, against the Eagles game. You know, the one where we decided to give up an 82-yard... Look, how do you have not one other guy deep on a run play like that? You're really going to play it in like that and stack the... Nobody, especially not Malcolm Jenkins back there. Really? Come on. You ain't that damn stupid. Ah! That peaked. I knew that peaked. Um, yeah. So, we just shouldn't have lost. And we did. And now I've been streaming for one and a half hours. And this has been a long thing. So, yeah. Thank y'all for showing up. Uh, I'm probably not going to stream until Thursday again. Uh, where we'll talk about the latest news and all. I hope y'all enjoyed this, by the way. Because this was weird. And rambly and funny. It didn't peak. Are you kidding me? It showed it on there as peaking. It showed it on my thing as peaking. So, huh. Wow, that's really cool. Anyway, um, yeah, this was fun. Just rambling about for five hours. Uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this. I'll be back on, uh, Thursday, when we'll talk about the news, I'll have five questions. I'll probably have just three questions, let's be honest. We don't need to be that asshole-ish. Um, ready for next time. Hopefully you won't hate me too bad for them. They won't be as bad as which letter starts an NFL team, which I think was the best question I ever asked. <laughs> God, I am an asshole. Anyway, yeah, this was good fun. Uh, next time... And the way it's gonna, I have a new, I have a format laid out for the next time. Uh, that pre-show AMA thing, I'm gonna do away with that just because I think it's stupid uh, and it's unnecessary when half the show is basically an AMA. 
Uh, so yeah, this has been good. Y'all can follow me on Twitter, capital B E N, capital S, capital L, capital A, capital S P O R T S. Um, yeah, this is going to be uploaded to YouTube as well. So you can find that YouTube link somewhere. I can't believe I don't have that linked in my bio. I didn't think of that. I'm smart. But yeah, this was good. So until next time, I have been Ben Schluter. This has been a Gold to Go Friday special live. Until next time. Ta-ta. Also, it stopped freezing over here, which has been nice. <laughs>